What's going on guys? It is very good to be back. I have been sick for about a week or so, which I don't know about you, but when I get sick, I am useless. Uh, my wife will very quickly attest to that. I am just cranky. I don't want to do anything. Fortunately, it's nothing too serious. It's just I, I think whatever flu or cold is going around. So hopefully you are you are healthy wherever you are watching this. But even though I didn't do much this last week, one thing that it did give me a lot of time to do is watch basketball. And the season has been off to an unbelievable start. I've kind of tried to see a little bit of every team. Um, wanted to do like a full overreaction type thing. Still might over the weekend, so keep your eyes out for something like that probably. But today, tonight, whenever you're watching this, I just wanted to talk about two teams that have not hit expectations quite yet. And to be honest, I don't know how long they're going to have to do that before things start to get even worse for both franchises. We will start with the Brooklyn Nets because the Brooklyn Nets played tonight. They lost in overtime to Luka Doncic and the Dallas Mavericks. Luka hung a 41-point triple-double on him, was just generally unstoppable. This comes after Giannis hung 40 on him in a Bucks win over the Nets a couple of days ago. And the Nets now 1-4. Things are not quite gelling. Ben Simmons, a lot has been made about him, his performance, his lack of performance, whatever you want to call it. All through the preseason, I was very convinced that he was going to look incredible almost immediately in this offense. And I don't know if it's if it's the pressure of the regular season or if it's the game speed or something, but something does not look right with him in this team. We had the clip from uh, Wednesday's game, or I think it was, yeah, Wednesday's game against the Bucks, where Kyrie was uh, reportedly shouting, shoot it, Ben, only to then come out in his uh, post-game press conference a few a few minutes later and say, hey, he's missed, you know, two years. Let the dude get back up to speed. It's been four games at this point, five now. Like, what are we doing? Uh, and that's true to a point, but the things that they that everyone on this offseason said, hey, this is what Ben Simmons is coming here to do, he just hasn't been doing. On the season, he's got 21 points, 18 fouls. He's fouled out of two of the five games the Nets have played, and he's got 13 turnovers. He's almost got as many fouls as he has points, and he has just not looked comfortable. He's passing up open shots still. He's not attacking the rim. And one thing I've noticed, too, is when he is taking these these floater shots that he likes to take, he's switching to his right hand. He's a left-handed shooter, and he has been. And people like uh, Kevin O'Connor from The Ringer have said for years, hey, try shooting righty. Like, you don't look comfortable shooting left. And he's always been adamant, no, I'm a left-handed shooter. So... I don't know what's going on with that, if it's a comfort thing, if it's muscle memory, and he's just kind of reverting back to it, but something is amiss there, but that's not been the only problem. The Nets, I'm kind of inclined to give them more of a benefit of the doubt than I am the 76ers, but not by much. Seth Curry and Joe Harris both have uh, missed a lot of games to start the season. I believe Joe Harris has only played in one. Seth Curry hasn't played at all yet. And, you know, they're going to be a big boost when they come because they bring more shooting and they bring, more importantly, bench depth. And, you know, the the Nets so far, Steve Nash has used an interesting rotation pattern, but without those shooters, Ben Simmons is going to be the point guard of the second unit, and he's not exactly what you would say a volume shooter. So they've had to stagger it a bit more to where Ben, you know, comes out like seven minutes left in the first quarter, comes back in a couple minutes later when Kyrie or KD take their rest, then he runs with whoever stays in, and then they stagger it all kind of off that way. When those shooters come back, it's going to give them a lot more chances for for staggering minutes, for resting those star players, specifically KD. You don't want to put too much on him too early because this is about the playoffs for this team, but the thing that Joe Harris and Seth Curry aren't going to help is this team's defense. This defense is getting just absolutely lit up by everyone they play. And, you know, yes, it's been Luka Doncic and it's been Giannis Antetokounmpo this week, but that's how it is. You're going to face someone like this almost every night in this league now. This league is full of stars, it's full of rising talent, and the Nets just don't have the defense to do it. Nick Claxton has been good in his minutes, but he doesn't exactly look like a world-beating rim protector. 
TJ Warren still hasn't played. TJ Warren hasn't played since the bubble in 2020. Like, that's crazy to me to think about. So who knows when they're getting him back. And he's more of a scorer anyways. He's not exactly going to be locking up the perimeter. So you're really asking a lot to do. And Ben Simmons was supposed to be brought in as the fix for that. He's going to run the offense. He's going to pace everything. He's going to use his his great basketball brain. And he's going to be able to lock down whoever the other team's best player is. So KD doesn't have to. And so far... He just hasn't been able to do it. He's had moments where he looks like the old Ben Simmons. He's getting his hands in passing lanes. He's, you know, blocking a couple shots. He's he's able to contest a, lot, a little bit. But there's also a lot of times that he's just getting caught flat foot on someone cutting to the rim or someone that's, that's able to, you know, create some space on him because he's slow to react. So the Nets aren't even getting what they expected out of Ben Simmons, not to mention The way they're having him integrate into the offense with everyone, with all of the starters, just feels wrong. (laughs) Like, they have him, the first play today, after, after everything yesterday, or after everything, I should say, Wednesday, with all the talk about he's been gone for two years, let him play games and get up to speed, come on. The first play they ran today was a post up where he had his back to the basket, they got him the ball, he made a quick move, and he scored. And it was like, okay, there we go. But still, post-ups, it's not like Ben Simmons was a post-up specialist in Philadelphia. His brand of basketball is playing in space. It's his ability to start the break as a six foot ten uh, point forward. And the Nets just aren't utilizing that. And I think, I don't know that this is a Steve Nash coaching problem, but like, so today, take today for an example. It was an overtime game. Kyrie and KD played 42 minutes. Kyrie maybe played 50 or 60 seconds more than KD. I think it might have been like 45, 50 seconds more. Kyrie had 10 more shot attempts than KD. He had 39 points on 14 of 31 shooting and 5 of 14 from 3. And KD had had 37 points on 12 of 21 with eight of those shots coming in the fourth quarter overtime he had like 30 points on 13 shots for the longest time it felt like and i don't know about steve nash i don't know what the what the thought is what the game planning is offensively but if i have kevin durant on my team i'm running that ball through him on every single play that he's on the court the man is a mismatch anywhere he catches it he can score from all three levels He's a somehow still just a masterclass in efficiency and shot selection. 11 of 11 from the free throw line today. He was getting the calls. He was unstoppable offensively as we have grown accustomed to KD being. I don't want him finishing three quarters of a game with 13 shots. Like to me, that is unacceptable. And that creates a problem everywhere else because now you've got Kyrie hoisting threes. And, you know, yes, he has his, his, elite handling and he can get to the real the rim at at will but he's settling for a lot of jump shots he's settling for a lot of mid-range jump shots those pull-up threes and those are just not going to do this offense any favors and when the defense isn't able to stop anybody like they you know maybe thought they would or like they were expecting with ben simmons it just doesn't add up to a good a good recipe for success and i think the writing's probably on the wall here for steve nash he's got to be on a short leash um after everything this summer with kd kind of saying hey fire steve nash or trade me that's it that's one or the other uh, i never really thought that they just kind of put that <laughs> put that all behind him but i don't think that the nets can can go another couple weeks winning one out of every five games and not do something crazy if especially if these guys those injured players start to work their way back and the team still struggles there's going to be some problems and speaking of problems speaking of short leashes on coaches even shorter than steve nash's probably is doc rivers in philly philadelphia is a notoriously tough sports city they will turn on teams very quick they booed the 76ers in their home opener they booed them in the first game of the year like it's crazy to think about but they are ruthless and the sixers have just underachieved James Harden looks like James Harden. It's stunning. He looks exactly like Houston Harden, which 
I didn't really think was possible after how he went with the Nets last year and then into his time with the Phillies, with Philly last season. But he has looked great. He's looked in great shape. His shot is falling. He's he's getting to the rim. He's getting those free throws. The problem with running the Houston style offense with James Harden on this Sixers team is that Joel Embiid is better than every single center James Harden played with in Houston. He's better in every conceivable way. And with this offense, the way it's running, Embiid is kind of just being treated like just another guy. And this is a dude who was second in the MVP voting last season, was an MVP favorite coming into this year. And I, I think it was Kevin O'Connor and Chris Vernon on the mismatch were talking about this, but James Harden averages 110 touches a game so far this year in five games. 110 touches to Joel Embiid's 70, which is a wide disparity for someone who is so dominant at the center position. Joel Embiid was an MVP candidate. He is an MVP frontrunner if he gets going. He can score or get to the line almost every single time he touches the ball. And yet, he's got to stand there and watch Harden dribble and then either catch it last second or watch Harden pass it to someone else last second or live with whatever the shot's going to be for James Harden. And, you know, that's a brand of basketball that works for some and worked for the Rockets teams, but that's not going to work for Embiid. He has already in this season looked disinterested. He's looked a little out of shape. He's looked unengaged. He's And, like, the commentators and everyone are already on that and already picking up on that. And it's been five games. So the onus is going to be on Doc Rivers, who has also come out already once this season and said, we weren't prepared, which, like... It's been five games. How can you not be prepared? They had uh, PJ Tucker has looked like a great signing for them so far. He's kind of stepped right into the role that they were hoping he would. But other than that, their bench depth has been really lacking. And there's a couple reasons for that. The chief one being that they traded almost all of it to get James Harden last season in the first place. So you can't really, like... So it's tough because Daryl Morey went and got P.J. Tucker and Daniel House and had this mini Houston reunion in Philly, but they have, those have not addressed the needs of this team. And the biggest need of this team, the biggest issue that this team is having, is that teams are just running them off the court. James Harden and Joel Embiid are notoriously uh, slower-paced players, I will say. They're not exactly eager to fly up and down the court for stretches of a game. Uh, and teams are exposing that. There's there's no real other way to put it. And in the Eastern Conference, there are a lot of young teams that are built to get that ball up and down the court as fast as possible. And by the fourth quarter of these games, a lot of these Philly players are older and looking absolutely gassed. The only person who has looked like, hey, let's, let's run, is Tyrese Maxey, who has looked great. But for whatever reason, whether it's they don't want to speed the pace up, they don't want this or that, like Harden, and Embiid, any of those guys catch a rebound, they are not looking for him on the outlet, even if he is just sprinting back up the court off of a miss. That dude is trying to create the pace and force the issue, and the team is just not built to do that. And that's going to be a problem when you start playing the Bucks, the Celtics, the Cavaliers, the Pistons even, the Hawks, the Wizards, all of these teams, the Raptors, Really, the only two I can think of that Philly would have a favorable matchup in would be Chicago or Miami, because everyone else has those young players that want to just run and beat you with their youth and their energy. And that's going to be a preparation thing. That's going to be a personnel thing. And to be honest, it's going to be a lot easier for Doc Rivers to be the scapegoat here than it is for anyone else. There, A lot of people aren't going to be willing to take the fall on that. So Doc is probably going to be the one to be let go this season if things continue to be the way they are. They're one and four. Uh, the most head-scratching thing to me is the, the team has struggled on defense and Matisse Thibel cannot see the court. I don't know what is going on. I know he's not a shooter, but there is, in my opinion, no reason that this dude should not be on the court to improve that defense. He has played in four of the games he has played a total of one and a half minutes this season. I can't believe 
I can't believe the lack of Matisse Thibel in this. He has taken one shot this year. It was a three, and that's it. That dude, I can't believe... Uh, it blows my mind because he is an elite, elite defender at all positions. He can, he can serviceably perform against the bigs, and he is an elite-level perimeter defender. And they are just not u- using him at all. He is just not seeing the court for Doc. And I don't understand what that is. You can live with him not scoring because you need that defense. And if he doesn't make that switch and start getting this dude some minutes, it's going to be bad. Because at some point, they're going to have to make some moves. They're going to have to figure it out. Tobias Harris is getting paid like a max player. And he's a third option that is inconsistent at best. So it's going to be a sequence of events if Philadelphia does not pick this up where Tobias, Matisse are traded in some order and Doc Rivers is fired with probably Mike D'Antoni coming in, if I had to guess, with the James Harden connection, the Daryl Morey connection. And this is just going to further become Houston East. And if that starts to happen, it's going to be really interesting to watch Joel Embiid through all of this because... I don't think the city is going to turn on Joel Embiid because I think they love him too much. But, like, if he starts, like, really getting pissed or disinterested or anything about all of this, then that situation is going to blow up into an even more dramatic mess than it already has the potential to be. So they're going to have to really play it smart. There's only, like, one or two moves they can make before things get really desperate. And that's part of why I think that this is, like, the time to worry about them with this slow start. Because they don't have a lot of options when when the walls start closing in. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they want to go about it. What they're going to try to do to improve. How they're, how they're looking. Where they're looking. And I, I hate to say it because I do really love Matisse Leibel. But I think his time on the Sixers is probably coming to a close soon. I think Tobias Harris is going to get the blame because they don't want to blame Harden or Embiid for for the struggles or the slow start. And it's either going to be Doc goes first or these trades are made as a last-ditch attempt to save Doc's job and to to spark something, some type of turnaround. But I don't know what's out there for them for for those players. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, And yeah, I I think that's everything I wanted to hit for tonight. Uh, if you're a fan of either of these teams or any have any thoughts, anything like that, please let me know in the comment section. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, like I said before, I hope everyone's doing well. If you found this video, thank you for watching. If you made it this far, thank you even more. I really, really appreciate it. I hope everyone just enjoys this weekend of basketball. Have a good day. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And I will be back.